Get ready. Get ready. Hi, I'm Hunter, and I'm from Muncie, Indiana, uh, Kelly Elementary School, and I'm in fifth grade. Um, today we're in the Port of Oakland, uh, San Francisco Bay, and that is located in the western part of California and near the Pacific Ocean. And today I have with me with me Terry. Hi, I'm Terry Smalley. I'm the crane manager at the Port of Oakland. Uh, tell them how high we are right now. We're uh, 120 feet in the air. We're, we're, we're up on a crane. The Port of Oakland is the fourth largest container terminal in the world, in the United States. Um, we handle about 2 million 20 foot equivalent units in, in Oakland. Uh, we have about 45% incoming cargo and about 55% export cargo. Let's go ahead and get on with the show. from Ball State University. And I'm Devin Williams from Burns Laboratory School and I'm in sixth grade. As Hunter and Terry told us earlier, we are on the San Francisco Bay. You can see the beautiful city of San Francisco behind us there. It's an absolutely glorious day. We want to welcome you to Biological Invasions, this electronic field trip program. It's an interactive program. And when we, before we get, begin, we want to tell you about our sponsors. Um, Ball State University. The Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. And Best Buy Children's Foundation. We also want to say a special thank you to our friends at the Port of Oakland for their cooperation. They're the ones who have the cranes that Terry and Hunter are up on right now. As we get started today, we've sort of invaded the San Francisco Bay Area. And, and Jeffy, how have we invaded the bay? In the crane, on the water, under the water, on the beach, and at the park. Now, you say under the water. How are we getting under the water? We have a diver. We have a diver, so you, if we're going to get him under the water, we better send him down, huh? Yep. Okay, go ahead. Diver down. Okay, diver in the water. Okay, great. We have the diver in the water. And if you want to ask the diver some questions about what he's seeing underwater, we have three ways that you can interact with us today. What's the first way, Jevy? You can call in. That's right. We have a uh, toll-free phone number that you see there at the bottom of your screen. Call in. We may answer some of your questions live on the air. What's another way you can get your question answered? You can email. That's right. We have a panel of experts all across the country who will answer your emailed-in questions. And then there's one other way you can get more information. What's that? You can go to our website. And what will they find at the website? Um, some activities and some more information to learn about what's going on. Okay, very good. So, we uh, already have a question. So, uh, who is our first caller? Caitlin from Indiana. Go ahead, Caitlin, ask your question. How many cargo ships enter San Francisco Bay each day? How many cargo ships come into San Francisco Bay every day? Uh, Terry from the Port of Oakland, do you have an idea for us? We, we actually look at cargo ships as they come in for the year. Uh, we have 1,900 a year. That's about 40 a week. Um, divide by seven since we do it every day. Um, you'll come up with how many we have a day. Five a day. It's just about five a day. So they're big ships. It takes a long time to load and unload one of those ships. It's about how long, Terry? 
it depends on how many containers we have that are moving on the on the ship. Sometimes we have uh, a two-day operation, sometimes a three-day operation, uh, seldom a four-day operation. If it gets to be that long, we put more cranes on it and move it faster. Okay, great. So already we've had our first interactive call. And remember, for those of you watching out here, we're here for you. This is your field trip. So call us, email us, get on that website and get some information about biological invasions. Um, what should we do now? Let's get started, huh? All right, let's get started with the show. Did you know that different species of plants and animals make their homes at different spots all around the world? Sometimes they get picked up and moved from their home to some new place. When we found these species somewhere, they didn't exist. Before we call that a non-native species, let's find out more about what non-native species are. Hi, I'm Greg Ruiz. I'm a marine ecologist from the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, and I study non-native species. All plants and animals have a native range, a place in the world where they live. Sometimes animals and plants are transferred beyond, move beyond their native range and become established. They colonize new locations. They become introduced or exotic or alien species. These are biological invasions. Today, we're here to to explore biological invasions. Why don't you guys introduce yourselves? I'm Paisley Burt from Muncie, Indiana. I go to the Burris Laboratory School. I'm in fourth grade. What do you have in your hand there, Paisley? A European green crab. Is that native or non-native to San Francisco? Native. It's non-native. Oh yeah, non-native. <laughs> from Europe. Why don't you introduce yourself, Riley? I'm Riley Delk and I'm holding a black finger cancer crab. Is that native or non-native? It's Here. native. In it is California. Right. But, uh, my name is Nathaniel Fox. I'm in fifth grade, and I go to Mitchell School, and I live in Muncie, Indiana. Non-native species are very common throughout the world in terrestrial and freshwater and marine systems. Can you guys think of a, a common non-native species? Uh, zebra mussels. Zebra mussels. That's that's right. Where do zebra mussels come from? Um, I'm not sure. I know how they were trapped. They were transported either on the hulls or in the ballast water of ships, and they arrived to the Great Lakes um, from Europe, and they've since spread throughout much of North America, and many of you watching today have a map in front of you, and you can fill in where you think the, the uh, zebra mussel now occurs within North America, and we'll check back in a while to see if you are right. Well, we've talked a little bit about zebra mussels. Like zebra mussels in fresh water, non-native species are also common on the land, but also in the sea. And many of the non-native species that we know in the sea were transferred here by accident, and sometimes with surprising and unwanted results. We're going to go to Chris in a little bit to talk about marine invasions in San Francisco Bay. There are over 500 non-native species in our bays and estuaries, and Chris is here at the port to explore a little bit with San Francisco Bay. But first, let's see where the zebra mussel has spread and see if you got it right. The zebra mussel first came into the Great Lakes, and you can see in the, in the northern part of the eastern part of the United States, it spread throughout the eastern U.S., and now it is moving westward. Here it occurs in very high abundance. It's a filter feeder and removes plankton out of the water column and essentially competes with many of our native species. And now we're going to go to Chris. Thanks, Greg. I'm Chris Brown. I'm a marine biologist with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. And I work out here in San Francisco Bay with Greg Ruiz on non-native species. And I'm based out here at CERC's San Francisco Bay Research Laboratory. And with me, I have a couple of non-native California species that have invaded the bay with me. Why don't you guys introduce yourselves? Hi, my name is Joshua Conley. I go to Mitchell Elementary School. I'm in the fourth grade. Hi, my name is Victoria Howard, and I'm a seventh grader at Burris Laboratory School. So, so far we've learned a little bit about what is a native and a non-native species, and we've heard some of the, the global examples and, and examples around the country like zebra mussels. So, Josh, knowing all that, why are we here today? What's important about San Francisco Bay? Well, because they have the most non-native species in, in 
saw the world of, and they have the fourth largest port in the world too. That's right. San Francisco Bay is recognized by many scientists as being one of the most invaded bodies of water in the world. Victoria, how many species do you think are here that are non-native? I think there's about 200 species here in this bay that are non-native. That's correct. About a little bit over 200, and, and those go as fish, uh, mammals, plants, and marine invertebrates. Marine invertebrates make up by far the, the greatest amount of species, and we'll be talking about a lot of those today. Um, why do you think that bays and estuaries are so invaded? Because uh, on the bottom of ships, the ballast water, some of the stuff can, like zebra mussels, all that kind of, some of the stuff like that can get on the bottom of the ship, and when they come here, they can get off and go in the water and invade. That's a really good point, Josh. Shipping, um, basically, bays and estuaries are focal points for many marine invasions, and it usually has to do with um, the fact that large numbers of humans live around bays and estuaries, and we'll get into a lot of different ways that species move around the world, and shipping is definitely one of those, and we'll, we'll explore that a little bit further. Um, but, but Josh, uh, Victoria, and I, and as well as everybody else that you're going to meet here, have been spending the week sampling uh, many different habitats at the, at the bay, and here's a short video from a boat trip we took with the Marine Science Institute in Redwood City. about that boat trip? Well, one thing I really, really liked is we get to pet a shark, a leopard shark, and we got to go down to the bottom and see some plankton mm -hmm. and stuff. And now the, and the fish that we saw, were they mostly native or non-native? They were mostly native. Right, mostly native things that we saw on the trail. A couple of the things that we did, did see that were non-native, Victoria is holding here for display. It's a Chinese mitten crab. And Victoria, is this a native or non-native species? I think it's a non-native species. Right. And do you, can you guess where it came from? Um, Asia, like in China, I think it came from. Right. The Chinese mitten crab was found in San Francisco Bay probably about 15 to 20 years ago. And it's believed to have come in either with uh, ballast water, which we'll learn a lot more about later, or through an intentional introduction um, as a food item for people. Can you tell us why it gets the name mitten crab? It's because of the hair it has on it. Claws up here and it makes them look like mittens. Right. And it has these little furry tufts that look like mittens, and we don't really know what those do, but uh, I, I think they put them there so we could find a neat name for them. <laughs> <laughs> so let's um, check in with Glenn now to see if there's any questions that have happened. Okay, thanks a lot, Chris. Before we get to the questions, uh, Jeffy and I are going to run a little water test here. We have a, a tool that's called a uh, refractometer, and this measures the salt content of water. So we want to test the water here in the estuary, right here in San Francisco Bay, and see what the, the salt water content is like. So, uh, Jeffy, why don't you go and get us a water sample over here? So, uh, Inside of this refractometer, this is a field device, and inside of here, what does it look like inside of here, Jevy? Um, it's like a uh, thermometer, maybe? It kind of looks like a thermometer. It has a scale in there with different numbers on it. And when we look through it, we're able to see, what, it, what does it look like when we look through there? Um, some of it is blue, and some of it is white. So the top part is blue, and the bottom part is white. And so when you look yeah. through here, where the blue and the white meet, that gives us a, a measure of the salinity of the water. And this time, it looks like it's what? About 25. Right. It's 25 parts per thousand salinity. So we'll be back talking to our scientist in a minute about what that exactly means. But right now we have our first caller of the day. And uh, Jevy, who's on the line for us right now? Amber from Indiana. Amber, go ahead and ask your question. What is it like underwater? 
What is it like underwater? Well, that's a great question, and we already have somebody who wants to know about that diver, right? Why don't we go to Bill, and Bill, why don't you introduce yourself and then uh, tell us about the diver that you have with us and give us a view. Okay, good morning. My name is uh, Bill Morrison, and I'm the diving supervisor here at the Port of Oakland, and we have the coolest job here at the port. We get to be on the 19 miles of shoreline that the port has on a daily basis, and we inspect many of the 25,000 piles that support the crane operations, this huge crane that you can see in the background. And, and now we're going to send it over to Don, and Don can tell you, Don is the diver in the water, and he can tell you what he's seeing currently. What do you see? What do you see there, Don? Well, I'm on the side of a piling, and uh, a lot of fluffy growth. What's that? Some bright growth. Sorry. And yeah, yeah. hidden among it here are some crabs, if I can find one again. They hide pretty good. Okay, back to you, Glenn. Okay, thanks, Bill. So we're already seeing some growth down there on the pilings and some crabs, but now we have another question. Who's on the line, Javi? Danielle from Indiana. Danielle, go ahead and ask your question. How do the invasive species affect the native animals in the San Francisco Bay? Okay, great question. How do the invasive species affect the native animals in San Francisco Bay? And Chris is the uh, person here who does the most research in San Francisco Bay. So, Chris, why don't we toss it up to you for an answer to that? That's a really great question, and it's, it's a, a, a really broad answer. It kind of depends on which species you're looking at. Um, some organisms that are here and in invasive, we don't really know the impacts they have on native species. Um, the green crab, which is a pretty well-studied organism and that we'll talk about a little bit more later, uh, has been shown to have some really severe impacts on native species as far as um, eating natural or the eating other native crabs and other organisms and reducing populations and that. So um, it's it's a it's a tough question to answer, but it's a, it's a great question, and it, it, if you were interested in doing some more research on it, you can go to our panel of experts, and they can um, maybe fill you in with some more individual impacts that, that some species have. Glenn? Hey, Chris, a question. Earlier today when we measured the salinity, salinity of the water, it was more up around 30, right, Chevy? Mm -hmm. And now it's down to 25, so what happened here? Uh, Glenn, the, probably because the tide has gone out, and so um, the water coming down from the rivers has diluted the salinity a little bit. This is an estuary, and an estuary means it's a place where salt water and fresh water mix. And so at high tide, the, the salt water comes in from the Pacific Ocean into the bay, and so you get a little bit more of a, of a higher salinity. And then during low tide, when the water is rushing back out into the Pacific Ocean, you get more of the, the fresh water coming in, and so you get a shift in salinity that way during and, the day. And that makes a difference into how species can exist in here, right? Correct, yes. So a species that's adapted to live only in uh, pure seawater, which is about 35 parts per thousand, wouldn't do well in a system that fluctuates this greatly. And so it's, an estuary supports a unique assemblage of species that, that are adapted to live in, in alternating salinity. Okay, we have another caller on the phone. Who's our next caller, Jevy? Jacob from Indiana. Jacob, go ahead and ask your question. What is the difference between a bay and estuary? Okay, the question is, what is the difference between a bay and an estuary? Let's go to uh, Greg over at the beach for that answer. Greg? Right. A, a bay is, is a place where it's, it's more protected um, from the open ocean, the open exposed coast where waves come in. And bays can be um, a place also where fresh water comes in. And when fresh water comes in, it, it's, it's called an estuary, where salt water and fresh water mix together. And it... It's going to pop a lot of that's okay. Go ahead. Okay. Thanks a lot, uh, Greg. We've got another caller on the line. Jevy, who's our next caller? Madison from Indiana. Well, we just lost okay. Madison. So, um, anyway, so we're learning some of the differences between estuaries and uh, and bays. And uh, we want you to call in. There's a, a one eight or a toll free phone line that you can call in on. We're already getting some great questions. So, uh, please call in and ask us questions. We have experts all over here to. Um, 
to talk to us about what, what we're seeing here today, right? Okay, to learn more about invasive species, let's go over to uh, Greg, Mike, and Hannah. Hey, guys. Hi, thank you. I'm Mike Dodrell, and I'm a teacher at Burris. I teach biology, earth science, and physics. I'm here with Greg and Hannah. Hannah, could you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Hannah Calvert. I go to Burris Lab School in Muncie, Indiana, and I'm in the third grade. Okay, we're, we're out here with a classroom from? St. Cecilia. These guys are back here. They're searching in the rocks, trying to look for native and non-native species. We also have some crab traps set back here. We're going to pull those in, in a little bit. What do you have in your hand? I have a crab. What kind of crab? Do you know? No. <laughs> it's a European green crab. This is a European green crab. <laughs> is it a male or female? This is a... Is it pointed? I think it's a female. You think it's a female? It might be a male. It's a male. It's sometimes yeah, hard to tell with those crabs. So this is a male crab. And you can tell because the male will have a more triangular um, abdomen. abdomen. And the female will have a more circular. Very good. So we have many species here, native and non-native, and, and like I said, they're looking over there around the rocks and, and trying to find those. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right, we'll, we'll send you guys to Lynn and Gabe. Hi, I'm Lynn Takata, and I work with the Marine Invasive Species Program with the California State Lands Commission. And I have here with me Gabe. Gabe, why don't you introduce yourself? Um, I'm Gabe Pickering. I'm in the fourth grade at Burris Laboratory School. Right, and Gabe is also an invasive species, right? Where are you from, Gabe? Um, Muncie, Indiana. Right. And um, so today we've been in the water and on the water looking at the different organisms that we find here at the Port of Oakland. Um, the guys on the beach there are flipping over rocks, looking under rocks, looking on the beach. And, you know, in addition to those things that we find uh, on the beaches and under rocks, there are also a lot of things that live in the water column. Um, do you know what those are? Um, plankton. Uh, there are two types of plankton, zooplankton, phytoplankton, little fish and stuff like that. Right. There are animals that we call plankton, and they tend to swim in the water column, meaning that they don't hang around on the bottom a whole lot. And uh, Gabe here mentioned two things. One is zooplankton, and those are animals, right? Mm -hmm. And then phytoplankton, and those are? Plants. They're plants, right. And they're very small, right? How small are they, Gabe? Uh, very microscopic. Right. You can't really see them too well with your naked eye. Um, so in order to collect these kinds of organisms, we use a special piece of uh, sampling equipment, and I've got it here with me. Gabe, can you tell everybody what this is called? It is called a plankton toe. Right. It's called a plankton toe, and this is how we collect plankton. And Gabe, do you think you could walk through this with me and we can explain how it works? Well, what you do is you drop this into wherever you're going to try to collect plankton. Wait till it gets to the very bottom. When you pull it up, all the water in the where you're collecting goes in through here. And considering that these holes are extremely small in this fabric, the plankton cannot escape. When they go through there, they come down into this little thing right here. Some of the water comes out here and traps the plankton. And then a little bit is left so they can live. Right, right. So the water goes through the top here as we pull it through the water. And this works like a colander that you have in your kitchen. It sieves out all the water and all the plankton are left at the bottom for us to take a look at. So Gabe and I are going to go take a look at, we're going to go pull a plankton tow here at the Port of Oakland and Chris is going to talk a little bit more about the things that they're seeing in the water. Chris? Thanks, Lynn. Um, we have spent quite a week here looking at a lot of different habitats. Josh, what are some of the different habitats that we've looked at so far? Um, we saw some even muscle, wait, just mussels, a bunch of sea squirts, and some sponges, some anemone. Right, and we saw those on docks and under rocks. We've been in the mud flats. Victoria, where's the one place we haven't really been able to sample until now? We haven't been able to look underwater yet. Right, underwater. We got a little peek of the divers underwater, and let's go back to them and see what uh, he's seeing right now. Bill? Okay, Don, uh, why don't you describe what you're seeing right now in the water? Okay, I'm on the side of a pile, and I've got lots of furry growth, a few little sponge-like growths, and a 
I've got a nice little crab here, a couple inches across in the shell. And he would rather remain anonymous. He's typical of what we see every day out here. Bill, we've got Stephen from Indiana. Okay, Stephen from Indiana. Stephen from Indiana. What is your question? Um, um, is there? Does the sea diver saw any sharks? Have I ever seen any sharks? Not while I've been working. They don't. Uh, they're in here every once in a while, but we don't usually see them because the water gets so dirty around us, and they keep their distance. Yeah, the diver's visibility is only about a foot and a half to two feet, so they're usually uh, further away, so we don't see them visually. Back to you, Chris. Okay, so what the diver sees right there is called a red rock crab, and it's a native crab to uh, the Pacific coast. And we have one here that we could show you. This is what uh, the diver saw, the red rock crab. And they're very common within the bay, and they like to hide under rocks and within the, the community that we just saw there. Speaking of that, what, what's kind of the, the average name for all those animals that, that Dawn was seeing down there, Victoria? Um, fouling communities. Right. The, the, the generic term for all that is called a fouling community, all that stuff. And, and Josh, do you know why they call it fouling? Actually, don't really know. Okay, well, they call it fouling because it tends to foul boats and ships, and so it grows in, in huge numbers along pilings and ships and boats, and it can cause a lot of problems with, with those boats, and so it's a, it's a fouling thing. And we'll take a, a much longer look at some of the organisms associated with that in just a few minutes. species we've talked about don't always go from one place to another all by themselves. They have some help from shipping, trade, mother nature, and even you. Let's learn about how these different species can become world travelers. In San Francisco Bay and other bays around the world, Ships have been a really important mechanism or pathway by which non-native species are brought, brought in, but also live trade. By live trade, we mean organisms move for food, as pets. And today, we have a number of organisms that you can order on the, on the internet and have delivered to your house, or even buy in local markets. Paisley, what do you have there? I have a lobster. Yeah? An Atlantic lobster. Where is that from? from the east coast of North America. Yeah. And these are lobsters that we, we bought on the internet that were delivered to our house. It's pretty active, looks like it's in really good shape, huh? Although you can buy the lobster here, it's not presently um, a non-native species in San Francisco Bay, meaning it, it doesn't occur here at the present time. Riley has some other other crustaceans that we also were able to get from the internet. What are those, Riley? Uh, these are blue crabs. Right. Those come from the East Coast. Um, like the lobster, it's also a predator. It's really quite common on the, on the East Coast, but isn't established here. Although both lobsters and blue crabs have been found in local waters. And Riley, what do you have? I mean, uh, Nathaniel, what do you have there? An oyster. Right. Those are, those are uh, oysters that actually were growing locally. Um, and oysters in the past have been really important in, in uh, bringing non-native species in. Not only are they a non-native species here, but as you can see from the oysters that Riley's holding up, uh, Riley's pointing at rather, and Nathaniel's holding up, why don't you turn it for the camera to see over here. Um, a lot of this growth on here, right here that, that Riley's pointing to, are um, tunicates. There are also mussels and snails, many different organisms that live in oysters. And when oysters are brought in, when they're shipped in across the country or across the world, 
they, they essentially serve as a home for a lot of these organisms that are transferred at the same time. And many of those organisms have, have actually colonized San Francisco Bay, and we have quite a few of them here. Um, you want to show us some of those, Nathaniel? So, what, do you, what do you have here? Uh, there I have some mud snails. The mud snails are uh, something that we've seen and looking around the bay quite a lot of, haven't, aren't they, Nathaniel? Yeah, we've seen a lot um, close to the bay. Right. And they occur commonly on sand flats and mud flats throughout much of San Francisco Bay and the higher uh, and the lower part of the bay. And the, the concentration that you see here is not, not unlike some that you would see in some of the, the ponds and, and pans along the mud flat. Um, what else do we have here? A number of other things that have come into San Francisco Bay with oysters. Do you want to say something about these, Riley? Uh, those are elytic oyster drills. Grab some. You can just pick up a couple of them. The oyster drill is also really common, um, often on rocks, but but uh, associated with rocks, even on some of the the soft sediments and the beaches. What do uh, oyster drills do, Riley? Um, they burrow down under the shell, and they eat the oyster. Right, they're a predator. They'll eat oysters. They'll eat barnacles. They'll eat mussels, and there are a number of other other organisms that have come in with oysters. Oysters serve um, sort of like a charter bus, carrying a lot of a lot of different organisms across the country um, or across the world. These are some Japanese little nut clams, and you also see um, some rather large drills, the the channeled whelk, which is also occurring in San Francisco Bay. Well, oysters have been really important historically in bringing organisms, non-native species, to San Francisco Bay, but other parts of the world too. That's not so, so true anymore because oysters tend to be shipped around the world in, in a pretty clean manner. Um, however, there are other mechanisms, other pathways by which organisms are moved around the world today and into San Francisco Bay. And, and Paisley's looking at one of those right now, which is uh, some rockweed. Paisley, you want to say something about that? This is rockweed, and rockweed, walk, rockweed is used for pack, packaging lobsters, like the one in this container. That's right. How, um, and, and what's what's the issue with rockweed? So this lobster um, was brought in, it was shipped to us from the East Coast, mail order, packed in rockweed. Um, why are we concerned about rockweed? Any of you guys have any insights of that? We looked, we looked also at some rockweed that was used to pack bait material, like these, these worms here, um, that also come from Maine, from the eastern part of the U.S. And we spent a bit of time looking at rockweed. What, what are we concerned about with rockweed? Kind of like oysters. Um, they bring in a lot of organisms when uh, you take them. There's sometimes little mussels or maybe even a crab if you get lucky. But there are a lot of <laughs> there are a lot of organisms in rockweed alone, and that could start a big chain of non-native species. That's exactly right. It, again, it's like it's like a, a charter bus carrying a lot of a lot of organisms with it. The rockweed is a home for many different things, crabs, mussels, clams, and in fact, in San Francisco Bay, we believe a number of non-native species came in recently with with packing material, like the green crab that we've heard about already, um, very common crab in San Francisco Bay, and also um, a, a number of different snails. One of which is is this. Um, Litterine snail that we saw quite a, quite a lot of on the shore, um, in the lower part of San Francisco Bay. In fact, it's one of the most common snails now on on rocky intertidal areas and in, in a number of locations within the bay. So they move just like regular snails. They're just smaller. Well, once they get here, um, what's what's different about these, of course, is that they come from another part of the world. But, but once they once they arrive here, they, they operate like a lot of the native snails. They use the same habitat. They compete for food resources. And in many cases, we think they can have a very, very large effect on some of the native, the native organisms that live here in the bay. Um, I think we're going to go back to Glenn now and see what's up with him. OK, thanks a lot, Greg. I'm over here with Jevy, and we're ready to answer some more phone calls. So who's our next caller? Tia from Indiana. Tiara, go ahead and ask your question. Is there a lot 
of litter around the San Francisco Bay. Is there a lot of litter around the San Francisco Bay? Have you seen a lot of litter around the bay when you've been here? Uh, sort of. Sort of? What Not, kind of litter have you seen? Um, like candy wrappers and pop tops and just things like wrappers and paper towels and stuff. It kind of looks like when some people have a picnic, they don't pick up after themselves. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, We've got another caller on the line. Who's on the line? Mason from Indiana. Go ahead and ask your question. Um, my question is, how many different species of crabs are in the bay? How many different species of crabs are in the bay? Well, the person here who does the most research in the bay is Chris. So, Chris, how many species of crabs in San Francisco Bay? That's a great question, and I, I don't have the, the number right off the top of my head. I would say ballpark probably maybe 15 or so species of crabs, and of uh, non-native crabs, there's three that are um, sort of the most prevalent. And so the crabs here are mostly native, but there are a few non-native crabs as well. Glenn? Hey, Chris, just a quick question. Can you eat all of those crabs? Um, yeah, the, the Dungeness crab, I, maybe people have heard of that one before, is uh, present here in San Francisco Bay. And actually, San Francisco Bay is an important nursery for Dungeness crab. They migrate in from the Pacific Ocean and up in San Pablo Bay, which is just a little bit north of us, uh, is, a, is an important rearing area for those. Uh, the red rock crab, which I showed earlier, it could be used as a food item as well. Okay, really good questions. We're going to be taking more questions as they come in. Um, so let's go to one more. Boy, Indiana is active today, aren't they? Yep. Connor from Indiana. Go ahead and ask your question. How many zebra mussels are in the U.S.? Ooh, how many zebra mussels are in the U.S.? We know that we can't really put a number on them. We can't count them. But, Greg, could you talk a little bit more about how it's zebra positive. mussels have spread and where they've spread? Sure. Zebra mussels, as we said earlier, came into the Great Lakes and have, have really spread throughout most of the eastern U.S. Um, east of the Rocky Mountains, they're really quite common. And they can occur in very high, high abundance, um, many thousands per, per square meter or even per square foot. And, and so um, where they occur, they, of course, um, cover rocks, they cover mussels, they cover, um, in some cases, crayfish. Um, and they filter the water. The water is quite clear. So they've really caused some big changes in, in the local waters. Um, how many are, are actually out there? There must be billions and billions of them. It's probably kind of like scars in the sky, right, Greg? Yeah, absolutely. There's so many, it's hard to count. Okay, very, very good. We're going to continue to take phone calls uh, here, and somebody else from Indiana is calling. Leah from Indiana, go ahead and ask your question. About how many kinds of fish live in the bay? How many kinds of fish live in the bay? Who's our bay expert? Um, Chris. Fish. Chris, right. Chris, how many kinds of fish live in the bay? One, two, three. Um, that's another good question. And again, I don't have the exact number, but the bay is actually quite rich in fish. And, and there are several species that live here. And um, everything from salmon that come in and the striped bass and other important fishing, uh, recreational fishing fish, and uh, as well as lots of little things, little gobies and such that, that aren't really big in what you think of as fish and I anywhere from probably maybe 40 to 50 different kinds of fish maybe even more uh, would live here and, and that's a good question for the website because some one of our experts that's there could maybe look that up for you and give you the exact number good idea Chris go to that website and email your question and we'll see if we can get one of our experts to give you a better number well speaking of numbers about 120 feet above us are who's up in the cab up there Terry and Hunter. That's right. Let's go back to Terry and Hunter up in the crane cab. Hi, Hunter. Tell me how global shipping works. Well, you um, load and unload the cargo on the ships, and then you take it out to any place like L.A., Asia, Europe, and other countries. And they ship a lot of different stuff like uh, meats and vegetables and the clothes and the shoes you're wearing and a lot of like auto parts and a lot of things we just need today. That, that, that's all real good. At the Port of Oakland we have seven international terminals. We handle cargo in and out of Oakland. We have 35 cranes. Uh, I have here a twist lock. I want to demonstrate how we pick up a container off a ship. You know, hold your hands out like that. This is a twist lock. We stick it down in the top of the container. 
There's four on the crane. We twist it and lock it. That's why it's called a twist lock. And then lift the container right up off the, off the ship. Thank you, Hunter. That, um, the containers weigh 40 tons sometimes. So we, we pick up a lot of weight with these little twist locks. Um, the Port Oakland handles a lot of cargo in and out. We have a lot of ships here every day. Uh, we have 35 cranes that are busy often. Um, is there anything else we need to talk about about global shipping? The, the, the imports we have. You, you were talking about imports earlier. The, the imports we have are, you know, cargo from, from all ports of Asia, manufactured items like cars, car parts, things like that. Yeah. And then um, the stuff we ship out is things like fruits, vegetables, nuts, meats, things like that from California agricultural products. Uh, the, the, the crane we're in right now is an integral part of this whole thing. The, the crane has a boom on it that will reach out over the ship. Our cranes are designed to reach some of the biggest in the world today. The ships today handle about 5,000 20-foot equivalent unit containers. They're actually building some today that are also 8,000. This crane, this new modern crane, will reach over those new modern ships. Uh, we're expecting them even to get a little bit bigger. Um, ship will come in, we'll, we'll bring it up alongside the dock, put the crane out over it, take the cargo off the ship, put it on the dock, put it on a, on a truck or take it over to, a, to the train, and then bring cargo in off a truck, pick it up off the truck and put it back on the ship and send it on its way. We like to move them out of here as quickly as we can. We, uh, we sometimes have a ship in here no more than about eight hours. Um, Every once in a while, they'll go for as long as two days, but we don't keep them in here very long, not like it used to be. Lynn, can you take it away? Thanks, Terry. One of the ways, one of the big ways that invasive species get to different places in the world is through the ballast water of all these ships that are con carrying all these things like containers and wood and materials. Um, Gabe, can you tell me a little bit about how ballast water works? Why, why does a ship need ballast water? Well, ballast water is what keeps the ship balanced. Um, if there were some cargo on one side and there wasn't any on the other, they'd fill up a tank on that side with ballast water so it'd be even. Right, right. So they use ballast water in order to get a little bit of weight when they need to do things like maybe lower the ship down in the water a little bit more so the propeller is underwater, or maybe they need to go under a bridge, right? So they'll take on some ballast water and weight the ship down a little bit. And sometimes when the seas are rough, they might need ballast water. Why do you think they might need ballast water when the seas are rough? Well, it'd be so that the boat just doesn't tip over. Right. If, if, a, if a ship is in rough water, it might flop around, just like a cork will flop around in, in water if you put it in. And, and when you add a little bit of weight, it helps keep that boat from tipping over. Okay. So ballast water is one of the biggest one of the biggest ways that invasive species get all over the world, particularly here in San Francisco Bay. Um, and some of the organisms that we find in ballast water are the same ones that, that Gabe and I collected using our plankton toe, right? Now, what we've got here, Gabe and I have pulled up our plankton toe, and we've got it here under the microscope, so let's take a look at what we find in there. And it looks like we've got all kinds of things swimming around. You know what those are, Gabe? Um, plankton phyto and phytoplankton, maybe other right. things. The ones that we actually see, you see the, the little animals with the antenna, and they kind of jerk around, and they're trying to swim around. Those are called copepods, and we usually see a lot of those in ballast water. Um, and um, there are other things that we find in ballast water as well. A lot of animals that most people don't think of as swimming animals, like crabs and barnacles and mussels, they have young versions of of themselves, the, the, the baby barnacles and crabs, and they have swimming um, versions, swimming phases of those organisms, so they can also be taken up in ballast water tanks. Okay, so we have a question from Carlos in California. Go ahead, Carlos. Um, what happens if the water is polluted? Are the fish um, okay to eat? I'm sorry, Carlos, I think I missed the second part of your question. Could you repeat it? Are the fish okay to eat if the water is polluted? 
Are there things that we can eat if the water is polluted? Actually, that's probably a better question for, for maybe Greg. Greg, could you answer that? Well, cer certainly when the water is polluted, th there can be things in the water that, that aren't so good to eat. And so you need to be careful about where you're catching your fish and shellfish. Um, in, in terms of uh, local waters, but, but there's a little bit of concern with, with ballast water, as Lynn was talking about, um, in, in that ballast water can be taken up in, in one place and, and actually carry organisms um, that can colonize another location and, and cause disease in, in people as well as um, some of the local wildlife. So you, you just need to be aware of, of where you're getting your fish from and, and um, make sure that it's clean and okay to eat. Okay, well, so we took a look at um, all the plankton that we have here in the, in the uh, sample that, that Gabe and I pulled up. And Gabe, what do you think that means for, for animals that come here? Um, what is all this plankton in the water? How does that help them out? Um, it supplies them with a lot of food, especially for the creatures that eat plankton. Right, for those creatures that eat plankton, there's a lot of food here. And it also means that, um, you know, for creatures that might come in on a ship, an invasive species, there might be something really great here for them to eat lots of stuff to eat, and it might be a really nice place to settle down and populate and spread, right? So we've taken a look at some of the plankton and the things we see in the water column, and, and I think Chris is going to talk a little bit more about some of the larger things that you see here in the bay. Chris? Thanks, and that's right. We, uh, we've learned so far about a lot of different ways that invasive species can travel from place to place. And in addition to ballast water and things going inside of, tank, uh, inside of ships, things can travel on the outside of ships. And, and we learned earlier that that was called fouling. We have some examples here of some common fouling organism, ig, organisms that we've seen during the week. Um, Josh, do you want to pull up that string? So this is a string that we found off of um, the Berkeley Marina. And you can see on it that it's, it's covered in, do you know what these are, Josh? Sea squirts. It's covered in sea squirts, sponges, Zebra mussel. <laughs> Those are and, bay mussels. Oh, bay mussels. And are they all one type of sea squirt, or are there lots of different types of sea squirts? Um, there's lots of different types in there. Yeah, so you can see this one here. This is one animal, and what does it do? How does it eat, or what does it eat? Well, it sucks in the plankton, and it squirts out the water. Right, it's a filter feeder. And Victoria, see this one here with the little little flower-like things? Yeah. That's a tunicate too, and this is called a compound tunicate. And so each one of those little dots is an individual. And they eat the same way as the big ones. Another example of a tunicate is this one here. You can see it's kind of warty and gross. And these come over from Asia. And in Korea, these are a delicacy. And so I was going to see if Josh, you wanted to eat this one. No. No? Victoria? No, thanks. Okay, so I guess it's me? Yeah. No, I'm not going to do it. You're not playing <laughs> In addition to tunicates, there's also sponges that come in. What do you, can, Victoria, can you tell us a little something about sponges? Um, they're another kind of, they're a smaller organism and they grow around with the, um, some of the mussels and other mm -hmm. things we see in here. Mm -hmm. And is this an individual animal or is this a whole bunch of animals together? This is a whole bunch of animals together. Right. This is another colonial type animal, and it's made up of a bunch of individuals that, that filter water together and feed. One of the ways that scientists study fouling organisms and, and what grows is by using fouling panels. And here's an example of one here that we had out. And you can see on it that it's quite covered with mussels and tunicates and other fouling organisms, and you can see that, that you can get quite a bit of growth underwater. So this is like what the divers were seeing underwater. So now let's take a closer look of what the class has been finding on the beach and go back to Mike, Hannah, and Greg. Oh yeah, we had a video of uh, the, the sampling from Berkeley Marina. Let's take a look at that video.
Hello, welcome back to the beach. I'm here with Hannah, as you've met earlier, and we have Kat. Hi, I'm Catherine De Rivera, or Kat, from the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. I work uh, in Greg's lab and out here in San Francisco Bay. I study green crabs, which is a crab that Hannah showed you already, some of the other kids, right here. Now, we know that this crab is from Europe, but it also is an invader in the United States. Do you know where it lives here? It lives in the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States. That's right. It also actually lives in South Africa and Australia, so it's gotten to lots of different places in the globe. We're interested in this crab um, because it has large effects on native communities. It eats native clams and oysters and other animals that uh, humans harvest as well. And in addition, um, it can be eaten by native crabs, such as the rock crabs that we found here uh, in the same area too. So Greg has one of these. So one of the interesting things here is, is that it, in this trap that was set out to catch crabs, we've actually found a lot more native crabs at this site than non-native crabs. And, and that, that, that's true throughout the bay. There, there are many locations where non-native species are fairly abundant, and there are some locations where they're less abundant. And one of the things we're interested in is understanding what, what's different among the different sites. Okay, we have the St. Cecilia kids have, have looked at all the rocks in that area of the beach over there. We're going to go to them and see what they have. You guys have anything interesting over there? Let's see what you have. What's your name? Owen. What do you have there? Uh, it's a black finger crab. Black finger rock crab? Yes. Native or non native? It's native. Is it native? Yes. All right. What else do we have interesting? As you can see over here on the rocks, there are lots of mussels. So there are all these little bumpy stuff, all this little bumpy stuff behind us are mussels that are, that are just very abundant with barnacles and stuff. Anything else interesting? What do we have here? We have a clam worm. Clam worm. And your name is? Jenny. All right. Do you know if it's native or non-native? Uh, I think it's native. You think? Well, yeah, yeah. it's native. Yes, all right. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, no? Anything else interesting? <laughs> what else do you guys find? Okay, right. let's see if we can hold it to the camera so they can see. Can I hold it down like this? Your name is? Jake. And you found a European green crab. Where'd you find it? Um, over by those rocks over there near the shore. All right, and you think it's native? No, it's not native. It's not native. All right, anything else? No. Hold it, hold it. See that camera right there? There we go. Thank you. Okay, we got anything else interesting? Another rock crab? Another rock crab. Well, your name is? Matthew Kittigua. And where did you find that? Uh, we found it in the rock on the shoreline. Be a good name for a rock crab, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the, the rock crabs here are, are really, really abundant, and, and we actually think that that might be one reason that the green crabs are not so abundant at this site, as they're, as they're fighting for space under the rocks. There's something else coming up here. What do we have here? Uh, Mediterranean okay. Mediterranean mussel. Let's let's see if we can get a shot of this. Your name is? Benjamin. And where'd you find it? Um, actually another person found it. Another person found it? Do you know what that is growing on it right there? Do you know what that is? I think it's, um, the uh, flat. You find them all over. They're really sharp. They scrape them off boats. It's a begins barnacle. With, begins with a B? Barnacle. Barnacle, yes. Yes. I'm sorry? They dropped the eel. They they have a a, a, a blenny over here. It's very slippery that they found. And it was up out of the water. It was up out of the water on in the rocks. What do you have? Um, I have a oh, we have we have something very interesting here. Your name is? Uh, Yale Kim. Yale Kim. Okay, what do we what do we have? Uh, this is a ghost shrimp. 
Okay, hold it down. Ghost shrimp. Is that native or non-native? It's non-native. Non-native? Very nice find. You find them in the rocks? Uh, yeah. Yes? Over by the shore. Yeah. All right, here we go. Now what do we have here? Monkey face flooding. Nice. All right, you guys are? I'm Gabriel. Camille. And Jennifer. <laughs> Selby. All right. Oh, that's a beautiful fish. You want to hold them? Sure. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> you got him? You think it's native or non-native? Non -native. No, it's native. One of the really interesting things about this beach, um, as we were talking about earlier with the crabs, is that there are some non-native species here. They're the fallon organisms that we saw out on the dock with Chris, and certainly in the in the sand and mud here, they're they're clams and crabs. But one of the interesting things about this site is a lot of the species are actually native, um, like. Like, like this fish, <laughs> the, slippery fish. Um, the worms that we were looking at, the crabs, um, and we're not really sure why that is. We, we think it might have to do with the amount of exposure that, that it's a lot more rough here, more like the open coast where we find fewer non-native species. They, they tend to be more common in more protected areas. Good. All right, we're going to go to a question and answer with Glenn and Jevy. Thanks a lot, you guys. Okay, thank you. A lot of interesting finds over there on the beach right now. And so uh, we've been getting a lot of interesting questions. Let's see who's out there right, right now. Logan from Indiana. Logan, go ahead and ask your question. Um, why can't you put filters so the ballast water won't have that much invaders in it? I'm sorry, Logan. Say that one more time, please. Why can't you put filters that, so the ballast water won't have that much invaders in it? Why can't you put soap in the ballast water? I think filters in the ballast water. I'm sorry, so you wouldn't have as many native, native species in it. Lynn, uh, that's a good question. Maybe uh, you could take that one. Sure, Glenn. Um, well, you know, a lot of people are working on ways, um, technologies to uh, treat ballast water so we can get rid of all those organisms that are in it. Okay. And one of, the, one of the avenues that was explored were gigantic filters to filter out all those animals and one of the problems that they're running into is that there's so many animals that sometimes those filters get clogged. Um, those ballast tanks on those great big ships are so big that there are so many animals that the filters tend to get clogged. Um, some of the other technologies that they're looking at um, to try to treat ballast water are based on UV light to irradiate animals and kill them that way. Um, they're also looking at some chemical treatments, and they're also looking at ways to take the oxygen out of the water. Um, so, yeah, great question. That okay, and a real, really good answer, too, Lynn. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, we're getting a lot of good phone calls, and we have um, a lot more time. We've got just about 35 minutes left, so if you haven't made a call in yet, you can still call in, right? And here's another call. Who is it? Tyler from Indiana. Tyler, go ahead and ask your question. Go ahead, Tyler. How many animals are in the San Francisco Bay? You want to know how many animals are in the San Francisco Bay? And I don't think we can put an exact number on that, but um, maybe, uh, Chris, you could just talk a little bit. We've been talking about um, fish, and we've had a question about sharks, and we've been talking about some of these organisms. What are some of the other animals that we would find in San Francisco Bay? Uh, within the bay, you would find a lot of marine mammals. Uh, there are sea lions and harbor seals. Whales come in here occasionally. Uh, outside of the bay, around the perimeter, you would get raccoons, deer, skunk, lots of different wildlife that would live in the bay. It's, it's a pretty diverse area. There's lots, lots in here. Okay, Chris, thanks very much for that answer. In fact, yesterday when we were out here, we saw a sea lion just swimming around. It peeked its head up and looked at me and then went back away. So uh, that, that's one of the example of one of the animals that are out here. Who's our next caller, Jevy? Corey from Indiana. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Corey. Go ahead. Uh, has anything ever spilled into the bay? Has anything ever spilled into the bay? Um, Lynn, you want to look at that one? Has anything ever spilled into the bay? Closer. So, so certainly things have spilled in the in the bay. That's a great question, and I'm guessing that you mean things that that might be harmful to the animals that live here in the bay. And 
you know, um, one of the things that my agency does, the California State Lands Commission, in addition to working with invasive species, is to prevent oil spills. And um, here in San Francisco Bay, we have a couple of big oil terminals, and there's lots of companies that come through. So every so often, there's an accident, and we do get an oil spill. And um, that's only one of the things, though. I'm sure other things spill in the bay as well. Um, you could probably find out a little bit more information on some of those other things on our website, or you can ask. Um, one of the experts that we've got to answer your email questions. Okay, Lynn, great. Thanks uh, for that answer. We've been getting a lot of calls from Indiana, but we've got another one from California. Who's on the phone, Jevy? I understand that we have Rhea from California. Rhea, go ahead and ask your question. How do you know crabs are all... Hold on. How do you know all the names of crabs? How do you know all the names of the crabs? Well, we don't know all the names of the crabs. That's what we have our scientists for, right? And I think Greg is probably the one we wanted to talk to. How do you know all those names of those crabs, Greg? Well, some, something that I studied in school, but um, there are also a lot of people who work on identifying organisms. Um, and, and there are keys that you can use to identify different types of organisms um, that are available. Some of them are online now, but some of them are in books. That, that basically show you the, the different um, diagnost the different characters or traits that an animals have. Um, so it, it's it's in the case of crabs and fish, it's it's pretty easy for some of the the worms and mussels and things like that. That can be really quite hard. Um, but there's a lot of information available, and I would encourage you to to look at some of that and learn some of the the animals that live around you. Okay, thanks a lot, Greg. Who's our next caller, Jevy? Grant from California. Go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, um, we were wondering what the fish do at night. Do they sleep? Do they sleep only half the time? Um, and how long do they normally sleep? Most okay. of the organisms. Okay, how long do fish sleep at night, or do they sleep? And uh, Chris, what about that? Do fish sleep? That's a good question. As far as I know, uh, fish don't really go into sleep. At night time, when, when the water gets very cold, they might slow their bodies down a little bit. Um, Greg, do you know of any fish that might actually sleep at night? I, I actually don't know very much about fish and, and sleeping, but I think that's an excellent question and something that our online experts could, could look up, or um, perhaps you could refer to the website and, and get some more information on that. Okay, good idea. There is a website that we have available that you can ask questions as well as calling in. And then what else will they find on the website? Um, some activities. That's right, some activities so you can learn more about uh, what we've got going on and what we're learning about here out in San Francisco Bay with bi biological invasions. Uh, we have another caller on the line. Who is it? Madison from Indiana. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Madison. Okay, one more try for Madison in Indiana. Madison, are you there with your question, please? Okay, it looks like we lost Madison, so who's next? Amanda from Indiana. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Amanda. Hi. Go ahead, please. If a poison fish comes up to one of the divers, what protection do the divers have? Oh, that's a good question. If a fish comes up to one of the divers, what kind of protection do the divers have? Let's go over to Bill, our dive master, for the answer to that, and we can also ask the diver down below the water uh, what's going on there. Bill? Yes, uh, the protection that the diver has is he wears uh, neoprene gloves and he has a dry suit on that encapsulates his body that keeps uh, his skin from touching the water, and he has a hard helmet that totally encases his head so he's protected from the water. And now I'm going to turn it over to the diver and he can explain a little bit further what protects him. Hey Don, the caller from Indiana wants to know what protects you from the fish in the water. Well, I'm wearing about a quarter of an inch of rubber, which helps. Uh, other than that, the fish really don't want to bite me. I'm bigger than they are and they want to stay away from me. Okay, back to you, Chris. Glenn. Back to you, Glenn. Thanks, Bill. Um, we're going to actually go back in a minute and take a look at what the divers are seeing and talk about that a little bit more. 
I was just curious, Josh and Victoria, have either of you been diving before? No. no? no. Looks like something you'd want to do, seeing Dawn down there? Yeah. 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 A little bit. Kind of fun, huh? Let's take a look again and see what Don is seeing. Let's go over to Bill. Okay, Don. Uh, what are you seeing currently in the water? Well, I've got a little striped fish here of the kind we normally find on the piles when we find them. He's just hiding amongst the grasses. It's almost like he's standing on the side of the pile with his dorsal fins. And back, at, back to you, Chris, what type of a species of fish is that? It blends in real well. Uh, Bill, I'm not quite sure what that is. Um, Greg, were you able to see that on your monitor? Oh, I... Greg, were you able to see that fish on your monitor and see what kind it was? And he moves a lot faster than I do. I, I can't see it very well. It looks like it might be a bunny, but it's, uh, it's difficult to, to see it from where I am. A lot of really rich growth on that, that beer piling, huh? Um, a, a lot of the sorts of fallen organisms that, that Chris talked about earlier, uh, looks like hydroids and, and some tunicates, um, very rich, luxurious growth. And those, those uh, pier pilings get colonized very quickly, which is, uh, makes, it, makes it difficult for, for Don and Kevin and those guys to do work in the port. And a lot of those organisms are able to colonize ship bottoms pretty quickly too, which is, which is one of the reasons that, um, or one of the ways in which organisms are transferred by ships. One of the interesting things about the pier pilings that I, I don't know if Chris already mentioned is that these, I think, are concrete pier pilings. And, um, they're replacing a lot of the wood pier pilings that have been used historically. And one of the reasons that that, that change has occurred is that a lot of the wood pier pilings were, were bored by shipworms, which are non-native to San Francisco Bay, and, and essentially caused the pier pilings to erode and, and wharves and docks to collapse. And so that's a, a case of a non-native species that's come in that's had a big impact. Um, in this case, more on, on human activities and commercial activities like the ones around the port. So um, it's really, really nice to be able to see underwater with the diver what's going on. I don't know how many people on that are watching in the classrooms have actually been underwater and been able to see things like this. It's a really great opportunity. Yeah, Bill, what else? What what else do you guys do? The dive team um, here in the port and around the Bay Area. What what kind of activities are you involved in in keeping the port operating? Well, some of the other activities that we do besides inspecting the piles, and then we follow that up with repair based on the extent of the damage that we see. Um, for example, the BART tube, we were going to dredge our, uh, we were going to increase the depth of, of the channel from 42 feet to 52 feet, and we had to go in and find the top of the ballast rock that covers the tube to see exactly what the elevation was. So that's some of the things that we do. Other things that we do here at the port also includes at the airport, with the approach lights. When uh, the airplanes come into the Oakland airport, they are actually on timber piles, and we do have the problem there with the uh, marine borers uh, eroding the piles. And so that's a, a lot of work for us there. We're in the process of changing those to a, a plastic-coated pile. And, and back to you, Chris. Okay, here we have a question. Kelsey from Oregon. Go ahead, please. How many species of crabs are harvested for food in the bay? Uh, harvested for food in the bay, only one, the Dungeness crab. Um, the red rock crab is commercially, uh, or not commercially, I'm sorry, recreationally fished for, so people can come out and catch them if they want. Uh, but the Dungeness crab is the only one that's harvested commercially for food. Okay, and now let's uh, go into the next segment, looking at what we can do to help prevent invasive species. Just because these organisms are traveling the globe doesn't mean they're all bad. 
but it doesn't mean they're all good either. Some organisms can become invasive, and then that might not be so good. Let's take a closer look at what organizations across the country are doing and what you can do to help keep these organisms in check. Hi, we're back on the beach, um, and we've been joined with uh, Todd Hines, who's a scientist at the Smithsonian and also the director there at the Environmental Research Center. Hi, everybody. It's uh, great to be here in San Francisco Bay, uh, learning about the research that we do at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. Some of the things that we do are study uh, patterns of invasive species uh, in various bays and port systems like San Francisco Bay and the Port of Oakland. What are some of the patterns of things that you've seen here this, uh, on this field trip? What are the species, uh, kinds of species seem to be the most abundant invasive species here that you've seen so far? What do you think about that, Riley? Uh, I think it's probably the mud snail or the Atlantic oyster drill. I see a lot of those. Yeah. Or the green crab. There are a lot of the green crabs. Yeah, well, we've seen a lot of fowling species too. Many of the species in here are in fowling communities. Where do we want to go next? We want to go out to take a, take a look back out on the water. There's a, a rather large vessel passing by right okay, now. Okay, let's look at the ship coming in uh, into the port of Oakland now. Right now, we're going to just take a quick look at a big uh, container ship coming into this port. Hi, you, you can see a container ship. You can see we're way up above that ship, so we can unload it if we had to from here. It's a container ship coming in from American President Lines. It looks like it's coming in fully loaded. It'll probably be working on the night shift tonight. An example of a ship that's coming in um, and it's carrying uh, cargo in here. Um, but some of the ships uh, bring in ballast water. Do we know how much ballast water these ships bring in? Uh, no. Well, that's one of the things that uh, the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center is studying here with the uh, Coast Guard all the quantity of ballast water that's brought into various ports um, and uh, around the country, trying to understand ballast water as one mechanism and uh, of transfer of invasive species around the world. What are some of the other things that we've seen now? We've seen live trade, um, right? That's one of the things we pointed out for pets and uh, packing material and food. How can we keep uh, some of these species from invading on those, uh, those things? What do you do about pets? Well, uh, you don't release them if you don't want them. You should That's probably right. take them back to the owner who sold you them. That's a good idea. And how about uh, packing material? What, what do you think, Nathaniel? Um, look in there to make sure that um, those are the right species. Yeah, don't, re don't throw it away when you're done, right? Put it in the garbage. Don't throw it back into the environment. Because even if you can't see things in there, there may be lots of small things that could be invasive. And Paisley, what do you think about some of the food that we've seen? So, like, if you're done eating food, just don't, like, throw it away. And right, don't throw it away. Water. So keep your pets, don't, don't uh, release uh, the packing material, and don't throw the food out into the environment. Throw it away. And, and a lot of what we do at the, at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center is, is try to understand what species are coming in and colonizing. And that, that gives us information that, that um, can be used to prevent new invasions from occurring. And whether it's on ships or whether it's with packing material, that information is, is used um, to, to, to develop new ways to prevent non-native species from coming in. Right. And uh, what are some of the impacts that we've seen? We've seen lots of different things once they're out there. Um, the big problem, uh, once they're out, it's difficult to uh, stop them. So we want to prevent them from coming in. We want to control the mechanisms of, of, uh, of their release and prevent that from happening. And also to try and understand the economic and the ecological impacts that we've had from uh, some of these species. Some of them are big impacts and some of them are, are maybe not so big. But can you predict ahead of time? No, there's no real way to find out when they're when that's going to happen or how that's going to happen. Right, so we need some more research so we can understand that as a, a problem that's uh, important for scientists to help uh, managers and policy makers out there. Okay, um, how about uh, switching back up to the crane next and seeing what's going on up there. Hunter, can you tell me, and now that we've been working on this for a week, uh, why is global trade so important? It's important because um, 
by shipping things, you can get a lot more weight and cargo onto a ship uh, than by car or by mail, train, or plane. And for um, example, you can't get a tractor onto a car or a plane, so mm -hmm. it's important. Some of the things we ship out of here are, are Caterpillar tractors, huge things. Yes. Uh, that'd be tough to put in an envelope, wouldn't it? Um, the Port of Oakland and all of our shipping terminal tenants are working with CERC. They're, they're working with as many groups as we can be involved with uh, to do investigations on, on, um, on ballast water and what we can do about it. We have a new regulation at the port. Actually, it's not that new. It's been going on for quite a while that all of the ships that come in and out of the bay are required to exchange their ballast water when they're 200 miles out at the sea. What that does is if they are importing any uh, invasive species in the ballast water, they'll dump that out at sea and they'll take on fresh water out at sea that won't have those same species in them. And um, they'll f basically flush the tank in and flush it out and flush it in and flush it out. So that, that's trying to minimize the invasive species we have. Um, uh, Glenn, take it away. Okay, thanks, Terry. You know, something Terry taught us this week about that tanker truck ship that we just saw go by, it had 16 uh, containers wide. So could that go through the Panama Canal? No. Why not? Because it has to be 13 containers wide if it wants to go through. That's right. So it has to be narrower than that if it wants to go through the Panama Canal. We have a caller waiting on the line. Who's our caller? Skyler from California. Skyler, go ahead. Uh, do crabs attack each other? Do crabs attack each other? That's a good question for Greg. Greg? What was the question? Do crabs attack each other? Yes, um, crabs, crabs do attack each other. Um, like for example, the, the green crab beats the native crab, um, the native shore crab here. And we've seen in some work that was done up in Bodega Bay, a real big change, a decline in the abundance of native crabs. They also will eat small, small commercial crabs too. So yes, um, crabs attack each other and can have big effects on each other. Um, one of the, one of the kids here, visiting, scouring the shoreline, has just found a um, litterine snail, a periwinkle that's from the Atlantic coast, and this is a species that is not established here in San Francisco Bay, although we found several hundred in the South Bay. Um, this is a species that could have come in with, with bait packing material that we saw earlier. Um, also, you can buy this as live um, food in the markets. We don't know how this one came, but um, th they do show up occasionally. So the, the door is still open, the pathway is still open for species like this to come in. First record for this site, we believe. Okay, great. You guys are finding a lot of interesting things over there in the beach, and we're still getting some really good questions, so let's go to the next one. Caitlin from Indiana. Caitlin, go ahead and ask your question. Um, how deep is the San Francisco Bay? I'm sorry, say that again, please. How deep is the San Francisco Bay? How deep is the San Francisco Bay? And uh, for that question, uh, why don't we try Lynn? Lynn, can you tell us that? You know, off the top of my head, I'm really not sure what the deepest part of San Francisco Bay, how deep that is. Um, that probably would be another really good question for our email experts. So uh, I'd recommend go ahead and uh, email it. Um, actually, Chris is signaling to me that he may have the answer. Let's go to Chris and ask him. The, on average, the depth of the bay, it's pretty shallow. It's about 8 to 12 feet over the entire bay. There are some shipping channels which can get to be relatively deep, like 30 feet or so, and then right outside the, the Golden Gate, there's a really deep channel, which I believe goes a little bit beyond 200 feet. But on average, it's a pretty shallow bay, about 8 to 12 feet deep. Okay, great, Chris. Uh, we have another caller on the line. Chris from California, please ask your question. What are the most common species of fish you find in the bay? What is the most common species of fish that you find in the bay? I think that's another good question for Chris. Chris? That's a really good question. In, in my own experience in some trawls that I've done on the bay, um, it, they, the, the perch and like the smaller kind of fish that swim along top are really abundant. And then also there's a, there's a lot of um, flounder-type fish, like flatfish, that, that are found quite frequently. 
frequently in the Bay. I don't know in terms of overall abundance which one is the most, but those are, in my experience, the ones that I've found the most. Okay, thanks, Chris. We have another caller on the line. Krishanda from Indiana. Go ahead and ask your question. Um, how deep? No, not how deep. How cold is the Bay? bay. How cold is the bay? Yeah. Okay, that is a very good question. And uh, for that, why don't we go to Greg? Greg, how cold is the bay? Um, San Francisco Bay is um, pretty stable in temperature, probably about 60 degrees today, I would guess. Um, and, and the shallow water, of course, up near the surface, it can be quite a bit warmer. As you go deeper um, in the water, like the divers are, I don't know what, maybe 20, 30, 40 feet deep, it's probably quite a bit cooler down there. Okay, great question. We have another caller on the line. Who's our next caller, Jevy? Spencer from Oregon. Go ahead and ask your question. Do you ever see any Asian clam in the bay? Do we ever see any Asian clam in the bay? And that's a good question um, for uh, Chris. Chris? That is a fantastic question. Um, the Asian clam is here in the bay, and it uh, is a it has been a big problem and has been studied quite, quite well. Um, the Asian clam came in... San Francisco Bay sometime around 1986 and exploded in number. There were thousands and thousands per square meter and has had really drastic effects on some of the communities up in the, the delta areas of the bay and the, the fresher areas. Great question. Okay, so one of the things that we did during the week as well is, is we got to look through some bait packaging stuff. Let's take a video, look at a video of that. So that was kind of fun looking through that bait packaging and, and Victoria, what did it kind of teach? We, what, what kind of stuff did we find picking through the algae there? We found some um, mussels and they were smaller mussels and we found some snails and other smaller organis organisms. Right, and so it showed that, that there are quite a number of different organisms that come in when we buy bait. What's one way we could sort of minimize the impact of, of buying bait or pets or even other things, Josh? What was the question again? Sorry. What, what, what are some other things we could do to kind of help minimize the number of invasive species that could come in? Um, well, there's a borash beetle, and it, it, can, it's a, it can sometimes get in wood packaging. And it comes from, like, Asia or somewhere around there. And it's somewhere around near the top of Indiana, it's the bottom of Michigan, in the corner of Ohio. Okay, so being more careful in, in what we pack things in and, and when we ship things overseas, being more careful in, uh, in what gets in those containers. Uh, Lynn, do you have any comments on some things being done around San Francisco Bay that help clean sure, up? Sure, sure, yeah. yeah. Um, my agency, the California State Lands Commission, um, one of our responsibilities is to manage the submerged resources um, of the state of California for the people of the state of California and that includes invasive species and what we're, we've been doing is we work with scientists like Chris and Greg um, to come up with solutions um, to work with the shipping industry as well um, so that we can find ways to try to prevent invasive species from getting to California. Um, we've talked a lot about ballast water and one of the things that we've been doing is regulating the shipping industry um, to try to have them treat their ballast water um, sometimes by mostly by uh, flushing their ballast water out at open sea to get rid of those invasive species before they get here. Um, we're also looking into um, the issue of fouling organisms on the outsides of ships and we're starting to look into ways to try to uh, prevent that and you know one of the big issues is is that we can't stop all the commerce that comes in because we need that stuff we need to be able to eat the food that we get from there we need to wear the clothing that we get shipped here and we need to use the materials to build 
of things. So um, really the solution lies in working with the scientists and the industry to come up with solutions to prevent those things from getting here. That was great, Lynn. I think that's a very important point, too. And, and everybody out there, I mean, the, the scientists, the research, the agencies are, are doing all we can to help uh, stem the tide of invasions. But it's up to you, too. Knowing what, what is in your backyard and knowing what's there and what shouldn't be there is a great way to help people like us that are, that are actively working to, to change it to help, you know, understand what's going on a little bit more. Okay, and now we're going to go back to Glenn. Okay, thanks, Chris, and thanks everybody who's been here in the San Francisco Bay for the past week learning about invasive species. Have you had a great time, Javelin? Yes, I have. Have you learned a lot? Yep. All right, well, we need to thank some people for all that you've learned this week, so let's thank our sponsors. Ball State University. The Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. And a really big thanks to the Best Buy Children's Foundation. The Best Buy Children's Foundation funds the electronic field trips. They've done that for a number of years. They funded all the programs this year, and we're happy to announce that the Best Buy Children's Foundation will be funding the 10th year of the electronic field trip program, which will be next year. We have one more group to thank, and that is the special cooperation from the Port of Oakland. We couldn't have been up on the crane or out on their docks or had a diver or been standing on this boat without them. So we thank the people from the Port of Oakland. I mentioned the 10th year of the electronic field trip program coming up next year. On September 29th for grades 7 through 12, we'll be at Houston, Space Center Houston, flying parabolas in a C9 plane. It'll go up and down like this so we can experience zero gravity. And Jevelyn, what do they call that plane? The Vomit Comet. The Vomit Comet. It makes some people a little queasy, kind of like getting seasick out here. That's September 29th. On October 18th, we're going to be at Coney Island, New York. We're going to be with the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum, and we're going to be talking about pop culture and baseball. We're we'll learning a little bit about American history. Then next spring, we'll be back with our friends from the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center and the Forest Ecology Lab. We're going to be 250 feet high on a crane in the Cascades of Washington looking at treetop environments. That should be pretty cool, shouldn't it? And then on uh, April 25th, we'll be at Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico doing a little spelunking, spelunking, looking at caves. So we're bobbing around here on the San Francisco Bay, and it's been a beautiful day. We want to thank everybody for being here. Thank you for joining us and calling in with your questions. If you still have other questions, you can still email and go to the website, right? Right. Okay. Thanks again for the ninth year of the Electronic Field Trip Program live from San Francisco Bay. Thanks for joining us.